Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of improving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes train the training material, if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. Good morning again from Fort Leavenworth. My name is Sergeant First Class John Broom. I'm one of the instructors in the Combat Studies Institute here at the Command and General Staff College. To my right is Dr. Mike Perlman, another one of our instructors and also one of the course authors for your MNS 610 course. Today we're going to talk about uh, lesson number nine, the evolution of modern warfare, the interwar years, 1919 to 1939. Uh, our approach to talking about uh, this subject for you today is first to deal with some specific approaches to this particular class um, in terms of ways to go about teaching it. Uh, and the second piece we'll talk about for a little bit is uh, we'll try and give you some information and some, some suggestions for places you might want to go um, to take a look at some other reading uh, to give yourself a little bit more of a background and an understanding of this very complex period. I think there's two principal ways to go about teaching this class. The, the class structure has got what, Mike? Um, naval doctrine, amphibious doctrine, um, air power theory, and mechanization. And there's, there's two ways to couple those three things together. The first would be to take a U.S. kind of focus, um, and building off a of Wigley, um, and discuss the role of the American military in peacetime and how it changes in peacetime, how we're sort of ignored. And the second way would be to deal with each one of the, the theoretical changes in terms of how armies in general change. Or didn't change. Or didn't change. Um, really, I guess the focus or is to say um, the problem of this lesson is that it's, uh, it's not simply an American topic, it's not a Europe being topic, it's really in a sense a global topic. We're talking about the U.S. Army, we're talking about the armed, excuse me, the U.S. Armed Forces. We're talking about European Armed Forces, we're talking about the British Commonwealth, we're talking about Japan, and perhaps we could even bring in China. What we've got here among virtually all these participants, with the exception of Japan, is the trauma of World War I. And how virtually everybody wants to say, we don't do that blank anymore. Four years of ghastly attrition warfare 
in which it's very difficult to determine who's a winner or if there's a winner. Or the winner in World War I is the guy who hits the canvas after the loser. And what we've got here is these alternatives about how to prevent this. Mm -hmm. And what are, the, what are the complexities? I wish this lesson were a lot simpler than it is, is that the political and geographical situations of countries like the United States and Britain is much different than Germany and France. The United States and Britain, strategic bombing will have a higher priority for simple reasons. Among them, that America has the best and Britain has the second best anti-tank ditch in the world. <laughs> you know, the Americans have got the Atlantic Ocean, the British have the English Channel. The Germans don't. And neither do the French. And neither do the French. <laughs> and therefore, strategic bombing, which is also politically compatible with the Americans and the British, is not wanting to have, quote, their soldiers in foreign territory. Um, continental Europe makes this thing more compatible. But this thing gets cut in all different ways, which makes, um, there is no one generalization or two generalizations um, fit all, which may be of some benefit um, for historians uh, or us who study it is we've got to muddle through this process, um, which is good because the people who are living it at the time uh, have, had to muddle through it, and they played for much higher stakes than we did. Much the higher. Yeah, the survival of their countries, their physical well-being, maybe their own lives, certainly the lives of their subordinates. So it's, um, to say this, you've got to almost be situation-specific. Um, well, let's, let's go through each one of the topics and, and kind of examine some of the issues we can bring yeah. out. Um, the first one is the, the development of naval doctrine. And that will be based primarily off of the Wigley reading. Um, Which then it would have an American focus. It'll, it will have an American focus. And there's two major issues with that, actually three. The first one is the whole background of the Washington Treaty and the limits on American naval power along with everybody else's. That's kind of the background piece. And then there's, then there's two issues of change. And that is amphibious warfare doctrine and air, or, uh, aircraft carrier doctrine and how those two develop during this period. And again, each one of those is situationally dependent. I don't think there's a great deal of resistance to the development of amphibious doctrine, either in the Marine Corps or the Navy, because they simply realize if they're going to go to war in the Pacific, they have to be able to do this in one way, shape, form, or another. Of course, there's a, there's a giant gap between development of doctrine, which may take three colonels in a room somewhere, and the development or the governments, particularly in a democracy, fielding the necessary stuff. Yeah, I mean, doctrine doesn't execute itself. As somebody said, we fielded the VGTs. <laughs> uh, of course, without the doctrine as a basis, when things really hit the fan, as in the late 1930s, we'd be thrashing around trying to get an intellectual ha handle about what to do. Mm -hmm. These men who performed a great service in obscurity in the 1920s and the 1930s at least gave the country a direction about what it had to do when it finally paid attention. And maybe this is, is the function, particularly in the 1930s, in an isolationist country, of the great benefit that these Pete Ellis and the rest of these only now known to historians mm -hmm. at the time dying in obscurity performed for the country. At least because they gave us that doctrine when the country became serious, it at least had a direction about how it would, what it would do if it became serious. Right, it, it thought through the problems. They thought through the problems, they saw it. Now obviously you can't do it in great minutia. 1943 in Terra, we found all types of problems in execution, which is where the rubber hits the road and where things become important, such as 
shore to uh, ship communications. communications. But at least um, we have the focus, and of course there's a terrible cost for experience where you find out it's these little things, the devils and the details. details. But they got the orientation. The, well, we'd be in awful different <laughs> Pearl Harbor if we said, my God, no. <laughs> what? what? Let's, let's fund the Rand Corporation and get a report in six years. Anyway, <laughs> think God, about how to do this. Yeah. And the, the, the second piece of the, the doctrine kind of issue with the Navy um, is the rise of the aircraft carrier. And now with that one, there is a, a tremendous debate and struggle within the American Navy, and for that matter, within the, the British Navy and to a lesser extent the Japanese forces, um, a, a real struggle between the, gun the, club and the, 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 the battleship guys and the aircraft carrier guys. And it's not really clear coming coming out of the 1930s which one is going to be it's the never, war winner. Uh, so I'm sure experts in this topic can debate after the fact what's the war winner. There will be... Um, in retrospect, people who, um, who are typical, particularly uh, in general, downplay the function of the battleship in the war. Remember, there is nothing that begins in World War II for the United States, no operation of any significance that doesn't begin with an amphibious invasion. And aircraft, and excuse me, battleships are absolutely crucial softening up the battle the battlefield and giving fire support for amphibious invasions I'm sure the gun club can make a good case after the fact let alone before the fact that we won the war <laughs> I mean these things will go on on forever um, and aircraft carriers are, are of all this combat power but particularly in the United States it's a, a very exposed weapon system. Our carriers in World War II are made with teakwood decks, mm -hmm. not steel decks. Um, no expert in, it'll be a shock to you, I'm sure, what do you call this, N nautical engineering, but a, uh, a, a teakwood deck not only makes light bearable on an aircraft carrier, because you're not living constantly at 110 degrees, but also allows you to have twice as many planes as a steel deck. The problem is this is a highly vulnerable system, particularly in combat when you're bringing all that fuel oil mm -hmm. up on the deck. And a couple of hits on the deck will create secondary explosions. It's what happens to the Japanese aircraft carriers at uh, Midway, which are also built on teakwood decks. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you've got this extraordinary jewel. I don't think there's anything comparable. It's in conventional warfare in which you'd have so much. It is. It's the magazine. It's the line of departure. It's all, all this enormous combat power congested and highly vulnerable makes this war really, um, there's some downsides about aircraft carriers. They're the prima de ballerina have got to spend as much time worrying about them being hit, hit, or more so, than using it. And many operations in the Pacific are essentially geared and operations rejected on the grounds that you're getting too heavily exposed aircraft carriers. You know, unlike anything else, those things go down. It takes three to four years to rebuild them, and you don't have them again for the rest of the war. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, this thing becomes, um, so we, well, like any substantive issue, there is no right or wrong. wrong. And these guys are, are coming to groups with very difficult issues in the 1920s, and everything you can say for the aircraft carrier, I'll come up with just good an argument you meant for, for the, the battleship. battleship. You can do it after the war, too. In the, fact, let's uh, do it right now. The, um, the, the doctrine for the aircraft carriers evolves. They initially start out as as an adjunct to the fleet, an well, aid to the fleet. Some they're, sort of for the gun club? They're, they're working as, as reconnaissance aircraft and then finally spotters. Um, and one of the reasons for that decision is that there's no radar yet. The, the battleships themselves can fire further than they can see. Far further so, than they can see. So how do, you, how do you adjust the fire at that point if you don't have any radar? Well, you put an airplane up there 
and where can you get enough airplanes to do this for a fleet, you got to build an aircraft carrier. Yeah, right. And then as soon as these guys start flying and start reading stuff like Billy Mitchell and do hey and start thinking about, wait a minute, we don't just have to look for the bad guys, we can bomb the bad guys. Okay. And so the, the, the aircraft carrier's doctrine and role evolves over time. <laughs> um, but it, it is a very, very interesting set of tensions between the two. And then you get to the point of, uh, well, what happens if the other guy does manage to get through your carrier screen? through the aircraft carrier screen that you've got out there looking for them. So the carriers um, are screening for the battleships the carriers, by the, the carriers are going to be screening for the battleships. And even when you get to the point where they begin to think about aircraft carriers as attack aircraft carriers, as, as launching out to hit the enemy, if that's all you've got are the aircraft carriers and you miss the enemy fleet, then their battleships are going to get into the middle of your carriers yeah. and it's going to be real ugly. So you got to have this balance between the aircraft carriers that give you the reach and the battleships that give you the punch and the aircraft carriers that lend protection to the fleet at a distance and the battleships that lend the shield to the fleet at close range. You gotta balance all of those issues out. And that's what the American Navy and, and the British and the Japanese were struggling with during the 1920s and 30s is, you know, what's the, what's the role and then what's the ratio between these forces? And Wigley brings out some of those issues in his writing. Air power theory, though, which plays right back into that aircraft carrier piece, um, is a whole other issue when we start talking about the rise of strategic bombing, which is the second major topic in the in the lesson. I um, mean, you alluded to um, the role that air power will play in the United States and in Britain. Well, particularly strategic bombing mm -hmm. because. The geographical positions of the United States and Britain, which have geographical protection, the idea that perhaps then using these natural borders of ocean, that uh, if necessary, we can stand off and beat, beat an opponent from the air with, with the hope that it's sold by by the aircraft. Now, uh, or the bombers, which is, remember this is, uh, this is new. It's been, it's been tried and I guess some Zeppelin bombing of the Germans on London. Um, but it's never really been put to the test and uh, these individuals um, want to sell their product that hasn't really been test marketed. Mm -hmm. And therefore, and frankly, to sell anything uh, in the world, there has got to be exaggeration. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anybody were on, we always discount what anybody says, 50% to begin with. So if these people were giving you very somber, what I'd say, worst case, pessimistic analysis of their capabilities, you discount that in half to begin with. with. <laughs> you completely uh, discount them, so they are going to naturally probably argue that they're war winners by themselves. Argue by, by, virtually by themselves and I want to, want to say that this is a conscious deception because it's so easy to deceive ourselves first but there is no hard data mm -mm. to either to discount them mm -mm. and obviously they are putting um, great faith in what they're doing and there's other things I'm not sure in, in the British system, but in the American system, is uh, where the um, the Army Air Force is a is still a branch of the Army. Now everybody's not nobody's being funded, but at least the Air Force can claim we've got martyrs because they are taking off in these terrible planes, landing, trying to land in these terrible airfields with virtually no communications. Mm -hmm. They've got semi-wartime casualties mm -hmm. 
during a peacetime I mean, environment, environment. Yeah. which, you know, at least, well, again, I know you're in the armor thing. The, Your thing doesn't work. You know, you kick the, you <laughs> kick the treads, you get hitchhiked home. <laughs> Those guys don't work. You know, it goes it's down. Fine. You've got two more martyrs there come Friday night. So they are are particularly going to be well, there's perhaps over-enthusiastic saying we got the war winner because life for them being underfunded is far more dangerous than it is for anybody absolutely. else. Um, although the Air, the Air Corps was funded more than the rest of the Army was because of that, that strange attraction the Americans have for the new to gizmo. Us? Yeah, okay. Um, and the flyers were romantic and they were... Well, they were Yeah, romanticized. Oh, you don't want to say romantic. Not on television. Don't <laughs> leave that one go. But they uh, <laughs> they uh, they became okay. idols. They became idols for the public. Well, in the war, I'm okay, but I'm not. I'm not sure they were they were necessary military flyers. Obviously, oh. the, the the closest thing we really had to a national hero in the 1920s is Charles Lindbergh, obviously. Right. Um, but the whole aviation industry yeah, as a yeah. whole um, was was the focus of a whole lot of attention. And from that comes interest, and from that will come some political clout behind it as well. But, the, but their, their argument, which is extraordinarily attractive in the backwater of World War I, which is saying we don't need four years of living like a mole in trenches, gas warfare. Uh, we can get this thing over with a relatively small band, it's very popular in America and Britain, which doesn't have large conscript armies, a small band of highly motivated Knights of the Round Table volunteers, which means Joe Sixpack, the slugs like me, don't have to go into the service and they can win it in a relatively short time and this is, of course, very big in the U.S. with, quote, precision bombing, bombing. Yeah, precision bombing by, by planes of the 1933 variety. Give me a break. But anyway, is then getting this thing war over fast. And by the way, it would even be the United States, precision bombing means we'll find some sort of bottleneck industry. Tree. And take out the one key industry, and then, and then, and then the, the whole thing collapses. Just, just collapses. And doesn't this beat the Argonne Forest? Oh, absolutely. Verdun, oh, the absolutely. Somme. I'll tell you, sounds a lot better. Again, it should pass the. If it sounds too good to be, be true, true, yeah, it probably is. Was, yeah. Well, no, the, the the original air power theorist, uh, Julio Duhay from Italy. It's interesting that that this theory comes out of Italy first. Although the Americans and the British are playing around the edges, he's the first one to get it published. A couple interesting comments to make about about Duhay. First is that. He writes a theory that's held up fairly well for the last 100 years, or not, not 100 years, but the last 80 years, um, that, you know, air power and air superiority can be pretty decisive. And he talks about, you know, the impact of that. And although it's never really quite been fulfilled, um, people will argue that Desert Storm, you know, was coming pretty close to proving it, et cetera, et cetera. And not only that, but the Air Force guys at Desert Storm, at least said so in retrospect, now we can prove. Duhay's theory is correct. What we have promised. Now, sure, we were important in World War II, but it proves out to be that if we had delivered what we had promised, there had been no need for a D-Day operation. There'd only be a few guys going ashore collecting mass surrenders. Right. Now we can do Dude, it. Yeah. And therefore there becomes this great tension within Desert Storm of, come on, give us two, three more days at Baghdad. They're about to surrender when the uh, U.S. Army ground forces are arguing no. Uh, sure, you made an extraordinary contribution, but you've now got to go into tank plunking. Uh, give us close air support, which is, of course, what the Army, Loves. the real Army, says has always been the function of the Air Force, whether they know it or not. But he builds this theory off of five or six years of experience. 
Whereas if you go back and you look at the naval theorists, Alfred Thayer Mahan, um, Julian Corbett, they're building theory based on, on thousands of years of experience. And if you look at the great theorists that the folks in this course are going to examine, uh, Jomini and Clausewitz, um, <laughs> they too have got this huge, <laughs> this huge database um, to work from. This, this couple thousand years of, of well, land warfare. Is, is projecting mm -hmm. that he's got a he's got a new weapon system and he is making a theory on what I project the West systems will be able to do not as of now no, but, but in the future. Down the road. Yeah and of course there will be anybody he'll be talking about what the weapon system can do but of course and this is natural anytime something becomes Comes nearly that good as I projected, there will be just as much, if not more, energy and economic investment in coming up to a counter, counter. to that weapon system. Right. I mean, all right, I, I'm getting to the point where I now can perform as promised. It'll shock the rest of the world to come up with a counter. In the case of the British, radar yes, to radar protect themselves from the Germans. Defense. And air defense. So there's a whole lot of issues we can bring out as we talk about air power and air theory. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then there's, of course, the, the true love of my life, yeah. the whole mechanization issue. That says something about your life, folks. <laughs> <laughs> the, guys, the guys like um, uh, J.F.C. Fuller, Liddell Hart, uh, Adna Chaffee here in the United States, uh, De Gaulle, the, the famous Guderian name that everybody seems to associate with, with the development of the Panzer yeah. Force. And here again, there's, there's a lot of tension between the conservatives who are going, yeah, tanks are really nice, they're great for trench warfare, but we're not going to do trench warfare anymore, so they're not going to be real important. Interesting when you mentioned these theorists, or the, I think you just mentioned um, five names, uh, only one being a German. Uh, there are lots of the differences between ideas and a national commitment to practice the ideas. Um, the British who, uh, if forced to go back to the continent, would much prefer strategic bombing. Um, Fuller and somewhat hard are, are prophets uh, who are much more honored abroad than they are in Britain. Uh, de Gaulle is an unknown colonel, uh, virtually a kind of a, an irritant to the uh, French general staff, mm -hmm. whose career is about to explode and die the minute the French win the Battle of 1940. Mm -hmm. Guess what? He's saved by the Germans. Um, Chaffney, um, or else even in the United States, I guess his greatest disciple, Patton, spends his life, as he would say, um, in captivity to the Doughboys. Uh, it is the infantry which runs World War One. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, World War Two, the Fort Benning Mafia. Uh, George uh, Marshall and Omar Bradley Eisenhower, his disciples. Um, this is the difference between here in theory and in practice in Germany, which pays far less, virtually no attention to strategic bombing. Uh, their weapon of choice is the Stuka dive bomber to give close air support, support for armor is Germany's geographical position is, guess what? If we don't win the close battle, there is no other battle. And therefore, the ideas, which are worldwide, anybody can choose them. None of this stuff is, is private. It's the Germans who choose to make this national policy. Mm -hmm. While these other things are ideas of theorists, but there will be no commitment uh, behind this doctrine. I guess, well, you know the French much better than I do. Uh, it'd be interesting why, because they have the same geographic and political um, I want to say, uh, the problems that the Germans have, the Germans, however, for whatever reason, decide that maybe because they lost World War I, is that they will have to take the Guderian seriously while the French have their own equivalent in de Gaulle, who is in effect turned out to exile. They go into World War II with a, 
a static defense, uh, heavy, relatively non-mobile tanks, infantry team, no deep strike. I guess figuring that even, the, you know, we won World War I, it was winning ugly. It was certainly nothing to be proud of right, in the history of warfare. There, there, there's no elegance it, there, yeah, but it worked. It was horrible, but we survived it. And any repeat, the Germans will crack before we do. They are a relatively small nation in the midst of the world. We win ugly wars of gross national product because we get the English as an ally, they get the Americans as the ally. We have the Russians or now the Soviet Union on the other side. Sooner or later, the elephant crushes mm -hmm. or the ponderous heavyweight, um, even if he's a plug crushes the world-class lightweight just out of out of mass mass well we can we can look at the case of britain and france in particular since they're the ones that the reading will focus on and let's let's go back to the french for just a minute there's some things that set the french apart uh, from the Germans in terms of um, their strategic <laughs> position. The, the French took tremendous losses in the First World War. Um, virtually half of the adult male population was wounded in one way or another, uh, killed or wounded during the First World War. Um, the worst ones were in taking the tactical offense. Right, exactly. Every time they'd launch out on the offense in World War I, they were just massacred. So they developed a very careful technique toward the end of the war of very limited offensives, a lot of preparation, very, very methodical approach to the battle. That will be their tactical approach as they go into World War II. E even more so, in a sense, the difference between World War I and World War II is that, well, in World War I, the French had lost the last war to the Germans, 1870. Mm -hmm. They have territory to, take to back. liberate, to take back. This is the impulse. They have to take the offense. Mm -hmm. In World War II, in 1939, 1940, they want to protect what they have. It is the Germans who have the political and strategic Strate necessity to, to take to the offense. So the French could say, lesson learned World War I is that he who takes the offense is just not a three to one disadvantage. Who knows who won eight to nine to one disadvantage taking the offense. Let's sit back. Uh, in effect, to the point that we even have tanks, it's to get us to the point of battle. Very heavy, ponderous tanks going about the speed of the straight infantry. leg infantry, three right. an hour. And if we can hit the Germans and head on, or they can hit us, rather when we take our firing positions, we're going to stack them up like cordwood. In, like cordwood. I guarantee it. Well, there's, there's some domestic and diplomatic pieces to why the French end up with this defensive doctrine. They've got a population of 40 million, the Germans have 80 million. So if France tries to fight Germany by herself, she's lost. She doesn't have the industrial capability on her own. She doesn't have the population base on her own. So she has to draw in allies. And it would look much better if I'm on the self-defense rather than taking the offense. Absol I'll have this opprobrium that goes Ab with it. Absolutely. But the French also figure that it's going to take some time to bring those allies in. And who are the two key allies? The British and the Americans, both of whom you know, who vow up through 1938 that we're never going to go to Europe again. again. I get and, another one I guarantee. And they, they also have small professional armies. So if they're going to come to the continent, and the French are convinced that the situation will be bad enough that, yeah, they will. They're, they need time to mobilize. It took the British two years to mobilize Kitchener's armies from 1914 to 1916 before they could put them in mass on the continent. <laughs> it was about the same time period for the Americans. If we declare war in April of 1917, we really start fighting in August of 1918 in a big way. But even then, there's not a whole lot of Americans involved yet. And it's going to be the spring of 1919 before that huge American force is ready. Well, that was the prediction. That's the prediction. So. 
we need two years, if, if we're the French, we need two years for our allies to mobilize. We have to hold the line for two years. From that flows the Maginot Line. Then domestically, you have the whole issue of the revulsion against the war, the split between right and left, the inability to develop a major national consensus, a war exhaustion, small year groups that leads to a desire to save money, to economize on the army, which eventually will lead to two-year terms of service, 18-month terms of service, one-year terms of service, and right. finally, six-month terms of service. They're training soldiers and releasing them in six months. And therefore, what they can train them for, even at the best, is to... Defensive it, warfare. Yeah, is to, is to get yourself in a, in a bunker uh, with a and, slit out the middle. And pull triggers. And, and pull triggers. Uh, there's, um, this was considered, as you say, uh, France has got enough problems in the world with Germany. Um, and they make their things even worse by politicizing uh, their um, military defense posture. In other words, what is politically correct. correct. And the, um, the left in France is as paranoid as the left in some other countries, which I will not name, such as the United States, which sees two army officers together and they think, think there's going to be a coup. Is that, yeah, is that they do want to, quote, get in all the Joe six packs mm -hmm. um, rather than having this band of brothers in the armor units. A professional army. Yes, which can then do these deep strike operations, which obviously takes a career commitment. Mm -hmm and a career of training is considered politically incorrect. It's far more compatible to a... Um, to have a people's army. Yeah, for, for, the, for, the, um, for the socialists or, and to the left, a very strong communist party in France, uh, the fascists, German and Italians, find uh, this elite band of warriors to be far more politically acceptable. Absolutely. And um, it would be, but it's something we face, we face in the United States mm -hmm. too. I wish it didn't exist, that uh, we could we could argue military doctrine on its military merits. merits instead of the political. Yeah, or what is domestically compatible, compatible. but um, by the time I grow up and face reality. The, the British also have some interesting problems is as they look at developing a, an armored warfare theory or, or technique, and that that is their <laughs> imperial situation. You know, the, the idea of the elite band of brothers um, would perhaps work in Britain with their tradition of an all-volunteer, professional, long-service force. But who the opponents in the colonial war? The colonial, the, the, the colonial empire that Britain holds has to be defended. And for that, and, and kept pacified. And for that, you need bayonets on the ground. Well, you also, but, but for mechanized warfare, what you need is armored cars. Mm -hmm. Light Not stuff. Tanks. tanks, by the way, the, if you would add, who is the most likely opponent that the U.S. ground forces will fight for 1919? in these contingency planning through 1938. John, you tell me. Mexico? Mexico. <laughs> I mean, how heavy do you have to, to be for that? Yeah. And well, this because, now this is the advantage is that the Germans have a national commitment. They're not talking about they have, yeah, going to the Falkland Islands. Essentially, they know who their opponent is going to be. It's going to be France. Um, France knows who they're like. The opponent it is, is going to be as good as the death out of them. Um, but just like if you, if you look at the Mexican border in the 1920s and 30s. It's a very rugged area. It's not yeah. very well developed. There's not much of a road network. There's virtually no railroad to support, you know, a major logistical kind of operation. So what do you need? You need horse-mounted cavalry, wagons, the kind of stuff that can go on its own and do its well, own most thing. It's going to be, a, it's going to be an Good armored car, armored which cars. Be as much that big a gas guzzler. Right. So, you know, and, and with the British, the northwest frontier of India, yeah. um, the the you know Afghanistan, um, and this, Africa, and this is of course the argument for them, the strategic bomber boys in both countries, is that guess what? Well, you know we cannot 
uh, defending these huge uh, frontiers. Yeah, you know, huge frontiers, and 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 do this with with ground forces. Therefore, I've got the solution for your problem, and that is I will win wars against modern industrial nations with strategic from the skies. bombing. With strategic and, bombing, while the yeah. while the army kind of serves as the constabulary off on the frontier, you know, against the Mexicans or or in in you know occupying the Philippines and and doing that kind of thing. So there's all there's a number of of different kinds of issues to approach here with this lesson. Um, just to summarize real briefly um, I think Mike disagrees with me but I think there's a way to approach this lesson from an American focus even though we're talking about you know a lot of stuff going on in different countries well, I agree with you there's a way to to approach it from an American focus it would be <laughs> Terrible lesson, but you could certainly do it that way. Well, the, the, no. my, my reason for, for thinking about looking at it that way is um, we've had an army of you know, 700,000 or more since the late 1940s. And a lot of us that have been in the Army for a while look at that as that's the normal way for the American military to be structured as a, as a large organization oh, and everything this is else. That's a very good point. Um, mm -hmm. By looking at the interwar period with a, with a, a, a not you know, solely American force uh, focus, but, a, but a, a, a more American focus than the lesson seems to indicate <laughs> is possible, we can see that that 40 year period from 1950 to now is the exception in American sure history is. rather than the rule. And that the rule is how do you innovate with no money? How do you develop doctrine when nobody cares? How do you keep a professional army focused on what its job is when the government wants you to do everything else, run the CCC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? That's the reality of American military history. That is what we have had to contend with. That's a very good point. Rather than you know, living high on the hog like we have for the last 40 years. The 1990s may look a lot more like the 1930s or the 1920s. And uh, that's the 1950s or 60s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's right. there, there's that approach of of examining these issues, granted on a worldwide basis, but but you know, looking specifically at the American experience and what it means to us. There's that method. There's also the method of of taking them topic by topic and dealing with them. You know, <laughs> what's going on with the naval stuff? What's going on with the air stuff? And what's going on with the mechanization piece? Now, for background. Around reading, um, you could always go to you know JFC Fuller's writings himself, Liddell Hart, um, Julio Duhay, The Air University publishes Command of the Air, um, and you can get it from the guys down at Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, Billy Mitchell's writings are available in some libraries. Um, Pete Ellis didn't write very much. There's a new biography on, on uh, Pete Ellis that's uh, fairly recent. If you look at the analysis piece of, the, of other people looking at this period and analyzing it, there has been a flood of information. Um, and I can't even begin to give you the, the, the short bibliography. Uh, if you're really interested in it, go ahead and drop us a line at CSI, and I'm sure we can come up with a quick reading list for you. Um, but there's a there's a wealth of information out there. Now, are we trying to turn you into historians? I hope no. <laughs> we don't need the competition. Thank you. And on that note, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks much and good luck teaching this class. Bye-bye.